So today we're talking about the five ways that you can improve your understanding of, well, anything. Hey, what's up? I'm Ken. This is Ken Fu TV, and every week I make videos on the martial arts, philosophy, training, technique, all of that. So if that's the kind of thing you're into, be sure to subscribe if you like this video. Don't forget to like it, and let's get started. So a few years back, I started developing a a theory, a process, a kind of a five-way filter to deepening the understanding of my martial training. Now, I'm going to speak to it from that angle, but this applies to, I think, truly anything if, if you look at it this way. So while you're working through your understanding of whatever it is that you're trying to understand deeper, then there are a few things that I think that you should pass it through, and we'll kind of just go through them. Not in a, These aren't in a particular order. They're just five that I think are important. So throughout this, I'll apply different martial arts, different things to kind of help give examples of what I mean. So first off, uh, one of the simplest places to start is the language. If the thing that you're learning comes out of a different language in the martial arts, that happens very often. You know, if you're studying an Okinawan or a Japanese martial art, you know, you're going to be looking at it probably in Japanese, though if you look far enough back, then you've got the Ryukyuan languages the Okinawan dialects. If you're studying the Chinese martial arts, obviously you've got Chinese. And when it comes to the Filipino martial arts, a lot of times you have different Filipino dialects, Tagalog, Cebuano, Visayan, things like that, but also things like Spanish because of, well, we'll get to that. Uh, so each one, you know, understanding the language I think is important. A lot of people want to strip language away when it comes to the martial arts. They go, hey, we're in America, we're learning, learning this in English, that's what we should do. And I don't agree with that. Now, I don't think you need to speak the entire class in an immersive, that language only sort of thing. I don't think that's necessary because if the people that you're speaking to are also trying to understand it at the same time, like they're learning the language from you and trying to understand what's going on, it's too much. So don't do that. But in the case of terminology, I think there's a huge thing when it comes to terminology. I'll take the Japanese martial arts, for example. So I've continued to look through that. As I work through that, you encounter things as simple as hikite, that, that pulling hand. Okay, well, that's its, its translation is this pulling hand. Well, suddenly this idea of power generation and other things don't make any sense when you realize, yeah, I should be grabbing something and I should be pulling on it. A lot of your technique opens up. You know, when you look at something like ageuke, ageuke being rising, you know, using a rising motion to receive something, that suddenly makes way more sense than an upper block, especially in the Japanese languages. I feel like the words were chosen intentionally uh, they're super simple. None of it boils down to some super secret, super great way to do things. It's not like the Chinese martial arts where, you know, the emperor holds the giant egg or, or snake creeps down the vine or, you know, monkey grasps the peach. These are really cool names that really give an idea of what's going on. And I think that's super clever. The Japanese didn't really do that, though. They, you know, maigere keage, it's a, it's a front kick that is rising. Um, the keage part is rising versus the keikomi, which is thrusting. And so it gives you some different context. So then suddenly it helps you differentiate, which one am I doing? What's the goal and how could this goal come about? A rising kick is going to have a different functionality than a thrusting kick. So understanding the language and being able to put those things together kind of helps get that all figured out. So that's the first one, language. Understanding that language, being able to better understand the things that you're trying to do. Because maybe the person that, that explained it to you or demonstrated it to you, showed you what it was, didn't have a good grasp of themselves. So when you start looking at it based on language and going, well, those words don't even mean the thing that we're trying to accomplish. Then suddenly, sometimes when you're seeing what other people are doing, when they do similar things to, to what you are trying to do, maybe it starts to help you make sense of, of what's different about it. Why these things, uh, like, why are they doing it that way when we do it this way? Uh, sometimes those words are going to help you understand if you're on the right track. If the thing says that you should be facing forward and you're facing sideways, you're probably not doing it right. The words imply that you're lifting something and meanwhile you're trying to push something down or twist something, then maybe you're on the wrong track. And so understand the language, at least enough to understand the names of the techniques. Don't When we go and translate them, in, in my case, to English and say, okay, well, I'm just going to call this an, an upper block. By stripping away the name, the original terminology 
I've also stripped away a lot of things that it could also be, other things that it could also mean, other ways that it can be used. So I think it's important to keep that original language when you're going through. And you have to also include, I think that, that keeping language is really important for, if you go train somewhere where you aren't fluent in the language that's being spoken there, uh, be it for a seminar or you're traveling or whatever it is, at least you have a dojo language, right? You've got a language that, that works for that. You might not speak their language, they might not speak your language, but when they say the name of a technique that you know, both of you are on the same page. I think that has value, so don't discount it. Okay, so number two, history. You know, what was it like? Was there a lot of contention in that area? There, you know, have they been conquered multiple times? Did they have a lot of wars? Did they, you know, what was that like? How was their, you know, the Japanese obviously had a class system. There was specific things about how all the etiquette and things worked in a, in a class system. The samurai is a really good example of something very misunderstood, I think. There's a lot of things that go on in, in the samurai culture that we don't see. Back to language, samurai means servant. So it doesn't mean super great warrior, it means servant. And when you start thinking about that, and the fact that they typically were beholden to someone, and why the idea of a ronin was a, was a very specific thing, you know, a, a ronin was a masterless samurai, and so it makes more sense that that would be different when the word itself meant servant. If you are a person who is not serving, are you really a samurai? But there were a lot of other components to that that exchange, that interaction with the class system, with the nobility, with all this different stuff, right? So understanding how that worked through history, how it changed, how it changed over time, tying that into the development of the art in that time period and what that looked like and why certain things were the way they were might help make sense of why they were the way they were. Understanding what things were like in that time period may give you a really good understanding of why your art developed the way that it did and why some of these things made sense then. Maybe they don't make sense now because those things have changed. Time has gone on. The things that made that relevant then are not there. Good, good example of the Japanese martial arts. There's some old techniques that would use the, the, the top knot, uh, you know, grabbing a hold of the top knot while the man buns back so we can get some different options now. Um, but suddenly with nobody's wearing a top knot, if it's no longer in style, it's no longer in fashion and that is taken away, well then those techniques might not make as much sense. You can adapt them, but when you see certain movements, you might not understand why they look the way they do. Okay, next up, we've got environment. The environment, I think, is critical. This is kind of this kind of frame. So I can't really show you what my feet are doing, but I've seen, you know, take Filipino martial arts as ones where they kind of step really high and just imagine my feet stepping really high as I'm moving. It seems really weird when you're standing on pavement and moving with these really high movements. And we've applied a lot of different ideas to, to what that could be. When the truth is, if you go back and look at the environment that it was developed in, you know, they're rice paddies and, and deeper areas where you're literally lifting your feet out of this muck that keeps you from being able to move well. Well, okay. Now it's pretty obvious why they would have moved that way and why other styles might not move that way. And then if you want to ask yourself the question, well, which one is right? Which one is the better way to move? Question the environment. The environment dictated what the best way to move was. Was it hot? Was it cold? That's going to dictate what kind of stuff you wore, what the clothing and things were like for that reason. You know, history and that can also, when we go back to that history side, that may also dictate, you know, there were times when certain, look at Hema, European martial arts. Throughout different times, there were different types of armor. We developed different ways of, of creating armor to protect ourselves, different leather and chain and plate, and each one of those moves differently and carries differently. You've got to consider that. Well, you don't have to, but you should. If you do consider that, then you start to get an understanding of why someone might have moved the way they did or my, why they might have allowed for certain things. Maybe if I've got, you know, if I wear looking at Hema again, when you've got, and I forget what they're called, so forgive me on that, but you've got this um, piece on your offhand to defend that side of your body, you know, then you might have technique that absorbs that. And I don't know this, I'm, I'm making this up. Okay, so take it for what it is. I don't know this for sure, but I could assume that there are, there are places that there were technique that relied on the fact that that existed. You had this additional armor over here, so you did certain things that I could give up this side a little bit more to create an opening because that existed. Now I wear something where that's not there and I don't have that option anymore. Now giving that up is really, really dangerous. You have to consider what was that like? So historically, right? And I've kind of jumped and I'm sorry. Historically, if those things were that way, there might be certain things about that. 
coming back into the environment, depending on, on, like I said, the temperature and is it humid? Is it a jungle type place? Is it, what is it like? Is it open and barren? Is it, you know, lush and thick? That's going to determine how you move, how, you know, how you might conserve your energy because of heat and exhaustion you got to be careful about certain things like that you might move in certain ways or do certain things you might utilize the environment in certain ways we train in a big empty flat room in a dojo we might not have some of those things maybe they were using the trees and the rocks and the different things to allow themselves to take advantage of those situations if i can move between those things or or take a higher ground or a lower ground or or whatever it is then my options become different not necessarily better or worse but they become different and they give me different ways of doing things take that and and sterilize it and put it in a flat room with a flat floor and suddenly some of that stuff may look very out of place and you might not understand why do we do it this way you're trying to preserve that method while not preserving the environment so you really have to consider that if you are a person who's kind of stripping things back and trying to make sure that you know rather than latching on to tradition and keeping things the way they always were um in a sense, making an art dead. If you're a person who's working to make it more functional and more relevant to the times now, then looking at pieces of that, maybe if I'm moving in a certain way to deal with standing in rice paddies, but I will never stand in a rice paddy because I live in an urban environment, then maybe there's better footwork that I should be using that makes more sense and that I really should be paying attention to because I'm actually not gaining any benefit and maybe even creating disadvantage by focusing on footwork that was good in a rice paddy. Not saying you have to, just saying you should look at it and and see how this is creating a deeper understanding. Even if you don't make any changes at all, just being able to look at this stuff helps you understand it better and understand when you really need to strive to make sure that that's accurate and when you can be loose with it because it's it's not as relevant to, to your time and situation. It's gonna change your training. Okay, so we've done the, the language, the history, and the environment. So now let's look at the tools. What the tools were like is really important. Filipino martial arts gives a really good example. They're a bladed art that used the machete and the long knife very heavily. And that was the tool they used. That was the tool that they used to do many, many things all throughout their culture. Tie that back to their environment, and you can see why the machete was useful. The bolo knife was useful in managing the environment, clearing brush and, and making way in a place that was was thick with foliage and all of that. You know, where is a place that doesn't have that? That's maybe not as necessary. The Japanese were a really good example of, of a culture that they developed a lot of tools. They developed very specific tools. And over time, they've continued to do so. They need a tool that's really good at that thing. They'll build that thing and use it. So rather than just carrying a knife and that knife does everything, they've developed different kinds of tools. And so their options were more diverse. Whereas in the Filipino culture, when I, from what I've seen, the, the tool set is much smaller, but they're much better at using it a number of different ways. So then how you hold things, how you apply leverage with them, how you, how you use them becomes really relevant to how the art functions. In a weapon-based art, how you use that weapon a lot of times tied into how you use that tool. And that's really critical in understanding why do we move the way that we do. Also understanding the tools that were available helps us understand the things that we might have been facing against and if those are still relevant or not. You know, when people carry the kind of things that they don't carry anymore, then we can let go of some of that and go, okay, I'm not likely to face that. I'm not going to deal with it. Look at law enforcement. Law enforcement back in the day, people were carrying swords and so some of the law enforcement carried tools that were specifically for catching, trapping, or even breaking swords. We don't do that anymore. We've got firearms that people carry and small knives. Law enforcement's carrying things like tasers and stuff that didn't exist before. So how you manage that stuff, when you move from a time where everybody was carrying a sword, or everybody, some people, that created a very specific situation that just plain doesn't exist anymore. Now if you see someone carrying a sword, that's weird. It stands out. And if you live where I live, it's probably going to get a gun drawn here in a moment to deal with it. That's just how it's going to go down. So you've got to recognize, is this still relevant? And I'm not saying you shouldn't retain it. I'm not saying you shouldn't keep it in there for, for the historical preservation. But when you're considering, is this practical? Does this work? You have to consider these tools and the changes of those tools, how they're carried. If they've become a lot lighter than they used to be, a lot heavier than they used to be, more usually the first one than the second one but you know now we've moved to tools that are much more ballistic so a straight line is very very important whereas 
if you look at swords and things like that, slashing angles and stuff were more important. All of these are just considerations that can help you understand better why we used to move the way we do, why the art moved the way that it did, and where we might have room to make changes to it now, or where things may still apply very well. So that's the tools. One thing I want to add about tools is people carry tools. They did it for their job or for whatever it was. You know, if they were in a farming community, agricultural, you know, whatever it was, they had reasons to carry that stuff. Anymore, look at all the EDC trends and things like that. We're carrying things for specific purposes, but our tool set's much different. Maybe I carry a little screwdriver or a multi-tool, but I'm not carrying a sickle or, you know, something like that because that's not relevant and people are going to look at me funny if I do. So now we've switched to carrying tools specifically for the idea of defending ourselves. We're carrying a knife that, that was specifically built for protecting ourselves. We're carrying firearms. We're carrying different kinds of things. But our usage changes too. Because when we carried that tool as a tool, we used it all day, every day. And so when it came time to deploy it to defend ourselves, it was no thought. It was easy. We, we do it all the time. So now I've just changed from going to an inanimate object to an animate object. Okay, fine. Look, now when we carry all the tools that we have specifically for that function and we don't use them for anything else, we've got to really train how to get to them, how to deploy them, how to use them, how to keep them on us and, and in our hands and that kind of thing because of the fact that we're not spending nearly as much time actually using them day to day. I look at guns as a good example because a gun is a, is a somewhat depreciable skill. When you look at a tool like a pen or a flashlight, you pull those out all the time and you use them all the time. So they're a little more readily available to you, a little more handy, and you're used to having them in your hand where the firearm, you need to dedicate time to becoming good at that, either on the range actually firing it or dry firing at home or wherever so that you get used to, how do I draw it? How do I clear my garment? How do I do all these things? So your training has to match deploying the tool that you intend to deploy in that situation. If you train an empty hand art constantly and then you think, well, I'll just draw my gun, you should go spend time drawing your gun. You should go spend time in a system that's that's utilizing that, how to protect that weapon, how to deploy that weapon. Because if that's what you think you're going to do, then you need to make sure the majority of your training is, is headed that direction. But don't train one thinking that you're getting the other. It doesn't work that way. Lastly is the culture. We've hinted at this, you know, there's overlap in each of these. And we've hinted at this along the way because when it comes to the history, the environment, and the language, a lot of those things are a component of the culture how the etiquette was, how the hierarchy was, all of those things come together to build the culture. Especially when you look at etiquette, there are things that an art may do out of etiquette that makes no sense and is completely out of place, purely because you don't live in a place where that etiquette makes sense. With a new student, I'll often talk about how, for example, the, the Japanese martial arts, because they're so heavily etiquette-based, there's so much of it. It's really weird and it's, it is hard to learn and you shouldn't feel disheartened learning some of it because we still do it we haven't stripped a lot of it out we maybe don't certainly do it to the level that they would in japan or something like that uh, but we still have a lot of it so it's important that they understand you're not going to get it right away and there's going to be times where you're you're going to mess it up and you're going to have to figure it out and you won't know it it's also hard to pass to someone because in japanese culture that etiquette wasn't the etiquette of the dojo it was the etiquette of their life that etiquette already existed. When they went into the dojo, those things became really easy to do because they did them every day. That was how they interacted with their family and in, in their households and in their schools and all of these places. So when they went into the dojo and did it, it wasn't, well, here's special rules for the dojo, like it is for, for us non-Japanese. Continue behaving the way you do and apply it to this place and these people. Understanding that helps you realize how all of that ties together is very unique and kind of weird. Some people have chosen to move kind of away from that because it's so weird to incorporate a philosophy that doesn't have anything to do with the culture they live in and have chosen maybe to apply more of their own culture and etiquette to their classes. And that makes sense. There's a lot of good reasons to do that. If you choose to keep some of that etiquette or you like, you know, I personally like the way Japanese etiquette works. I like the the thoughtfulness, the intent, and the whole nature of being present. I like it. It slows me down. It, it helps me separate my time training from my time day to day. It is different, but that's part of the thing that's nice. I go and I put on totally different clothes and I use a totally different etiquette. Maybe not totally. That stuff bleeds over in a good way, I think, and, and operate differently. So it helps me truly separate what's going on while I'm there, which is really good. One of the things my instructor gave me a long time ago is he said, when you come in here and you bow at the door, 
actively take time to give yourself permission to train, to leave things behind and let this time be for you, be selfish for a minute. And that's huge. If I don't have that, if I didn't have that, I don't know how I could handle the stress of some of the things that go on in my daily life or the kind of work that I do and stuff like that. It would, it would eventually be non-sustainable. I wouldn't be able to keep up with that stress without having something to relieve it. And having that hard cut, putting on different clothes and being really present and having a lot of intent when you bow or follow other types of etiquette really helps me to separate from that stressful part of my life with work and everything that's going on and being able to breathe for a minute and reset and clear my head. That's huge. So I keep that in. So I've continued to maintain that because that's, it helps. It helps have that separation. And for me, it's invaluable. So that's it. That's the five. The five are the language, the history, the environment, the tools, and the culture. And all of those things, as they come together and the way they overlap, all of that stuff, if you address those, if you research those and come to understand those and ask questions about those things, you will come to understand your art better. I'm not saying it will make you better at your art. That's up to you. You got to put the time in. But having a clearer understanding of why you do the things you do and, and if that way still makes sense or if there are things that you need to make adjustments for for the current time and situation, I believe it will make you better. It will make you better at deploying your art. It will give you a better understanding of how to do it correctly and properly. And when I say correctly and properly, I mean functional. I don't mean I did it the way that they used to do it. I mean, I do it a way that works and it works for me and it works in the environment that I work in. So in that way, I think this stuff will make you better. Altogether, those five things, I believe is a great five-way filter to deepen that knowledge. That's it for today. Another episode of Ken Learns Ken Fu in the can. Just hit 400 subscribers. That's crazy. I really appreciate all of you and I hope that this is valuable. And if there are things that I can do to make this better or things that you want to hear me talk about, hit those in the comments and let's keep it going. I'm really excited to have all of you here. Thank you for subscribing and making this a part of your life. If you liked this video, be sure to like that. Share it with somebody. If you think this can help somebody, share it. And then lastly, if you like videos like this, subscribe. I make videos every Monday and then I release other types of videos throughout the week. If you do subscribe, hit that notification bell. So while I make videos every Monday, I'm not as consistent on the other ones I release. So you'll get a notification when those ones come out. That said, that's it for me. I'll catch you in the next one.